We have uh, one more main speaker, uh, Dave Patterson, who also needs no introduction, but we will uh, anyways. Um, actually, I want to take uh, a minute to thank Dave because he's also serving as uh, vice chair for external relations and the rest of the external relations group that manages to pull this off uh, every year so smoothly. So uh, I, we've got various parts of the XRG staff uh, scattered around. I want to just say a thank you to Dave and the rest of the team for pulling this together. Thanks. So um, I think you got a sense from the first two talks of how uh, fluidly we work across the EECS boundary and how bringing that together uh, really vitalizes the whole enterprise. And uh, from a Dick's tarp, the, you know, the sense that uh, computing is really fundamental throughout the sciences, through the social sciences and, and so forth. Um, also, the willingness to make very long-term commitments. And uh, in previous bears, we've talked about the micro lab and the nano fab and this view that as a department we have to be prepared to take this 30 year view. So uh, Dave's going to show a little more of that sense of taking that mix of theory and practice and EE and CS and, and reaching out to make the world a better place for people. Dave, thanks. Thanks, David. All right, I'm batting cleanup here. Uh, right be, what happens next, besides a break, is you get the uh, 12 bright PhD students. They're gonna give five minutes on um, several of the centers here, and then we, uh, we go after lunch. Um, so uh, this is a part of the AMP project. I just wanna put up our sponsor slide uh, here at the beginning. We have three founding sponsors, Amazon, uh, Google, and SAP, about another 20 companies besides the DARPA NSF support they talked about. So to do a big data project, you need big data. <laughs> so, and uh, usually if universities can get big data, it's usually boring <laughs> or it's not big. If it's interesting, it's small. So we got started by the search for interesting big data. There was a person in our lab from UC San Francisco uh, in the Brad lab before the AMP lab. And I had to give this talk at UC Santa Barbara where we were introducing the AMP technology uh, that Mike Franklin uh, leads. I'm just a, a worker on this one. And, uh, but I couldn't give a big data talk if we didn't have any big data, and he convinced me that cancer genomics uh, would be a great solution to my problem of what would be a good talk. And as, what happened was, as I tried to give a good talk about cancer genomics, I got hooked. <laughs> I believed my own talk, and so that's what you're gonna hear about today. But it's been, been that uh, need to present well that's led to this interesting change in my career. So I'm going to give you a over, quick overview of the AMP lab. Uh, how could computer scientists possibly help with cancer? Uh, Genetics 101 and Cancer 101. Uh, we'll talk about our first research result, which is a really fast and accurate uh, piece of software that does a key piece of the genomics pipeline. What's going to be like to fight cancer in the future? Uh, particularly, we're going to need a warehouse to create a gold mine of cancer-fighting information and then wrap up with a kind of a challenge. The AMP Lab is, has these three pieces around massive data. There's, uh, the A is for algorithms, machine learning algorithms. Uh, we've got Michael Jordan, the Michael Jordan of machine learning working uh, with us. Cloud computing is the, is the machines parts, uh, and, and crowdsourcing is the people part. Uh, it's started last year, it lasts about six years altogether. We've got the strengths of machine learning, database system networking, and as David mentioned, we are following in the great tradition of BSD, Berkeley, Unix, uh, Ingress, Postgres, and very impactful software from the CAD community as well. We hope to do that again with the Berkeley data analysis stack, which will be open source and made available. Um, uh, it's hard not to give this talk without you know, mentioning that the president mentioned us when they talked about big data. Uh, what's the BDAS stack going to be? Starting off with the Hadoop file system, building up from that, a Mesos, which is software that's already open source, an Apache project that's being distributed, a cluster resource manager, a building block on top of that is a reliable distributed memory, which is a lot faster than disks. Spark, which is, you hear a lot about, is a new programming language, an alternative to MapReduce that's highly productive, a streaming version of it, a SQL in interface on top of it so you can run SQL queries. It, there's also other standard software from other people like uh, 
MPI uh, Blink, which is a very fast approximate database, so it doesn't wait to get the final bit of answer. It gives you an answer with error bars. And then a, machine learning is hard to pick up. Here's a way uh, to write it declaratively, almost SQL-like, and get the right machine learning algorithm. Spark is a surprisingly popular <laughs> programming language that got built here in Berkeley. Um, it's, it's again for MapReduce putting thousands of machines together, but it keeps things in memory rather than on disk, and it handles iteration a lot better than uh, MapReduce does. So it can run things 100 times faster, uh, even 10 times faster when it's on disk. It's one of these embedded domain-specific languages inside of Scala, and it works also with Java and Python. It's compatible with the Hadoop, the, the open source MapReduce system. And Matei, right after the break, is actually, because AMP is alphabetically first, we'll talk, tell more about Spark, and Matei is the author of Spark. So, big picture, how in the world would computer science help with the war on cancer? First is to create software that can analyze this tsunami of data that's gonna be coming from these gene sequencers, which I'll tell you about. But secondly, to create these gold mines of the information about the genetic information, the patient records, and the therapies, and how do they all work? What's the relationship between these drugs? And that'll be the two halves of the talk. So the good news and bad news about cancer, of course, it's this terrible race of disease. It's as we conquer the other diseases, cancer stays there. It's been around for a millennium. Today in the United States, a third of women will face cancer in their lifetime and half of men will face cancer in their lifetime. Surprisingly, recently, biologists discovered that cancer is really a genetic disease. Uh, it happens because of the normal cell reproduction by bad chance, you, a reproduction that will change the genetic nature of, uh, of, a cancer, of a cell to become cancerous. And then if you do car are exposed to carcinogenics, that changes your mutation rate, rolls the dice more time, increases your chances of having one of these mutations. So the sequencing of DNA is dramatic. The Human uh, Genome Project, which we remember, it's a million times less than it was when that project was done just, just 10 times going on this projected fall. Uh, so why is that bad news? Because we're gonna get, uh, right now, the processing software is be being built by scientists, and so the analysis of it is pretty slow and a little buggy. Uh, and so the cost of analyzing the DNA is exceeding the web lab cost as the web lab cost are dropping. And we don't have any place to store it. Where, you know, individual hospitals or clinics are analyzing it, but they do the analysis and then throw it away rather than creating this repository. So a little bit about genetics, the double-stranded, we all remember that, half from your mom, half from your dad. Are there these base pairs that link the strands together, the G, C, and A, T pairs, that's the, these little red links on both sides of it, and there's about 3.2 billion of these base pairs in the human GNA. A gene is a collection of these base pairs. There's approximately 25,000 genes, and each of them are, on average, about 25,000 base pairs. And this is this uh, unit of heredity that, you know, they figured out it had to be there before we even uh, knew about DNA. And it produces these enzymes that controls the creation of a protein, and a pathway is a set of chemical reactions in a cell that, that maintain the organism, and it's controlled in part by the, the gene. So base pairs, gene, pathways, I remember that. What cancer is, is normal cells uh, have these built-in governors that keep it from uh, dividing too many times. Uh, cancer is this bizarro cell. It, it's, those governors are off, and it can be immortal, live mortal, et cetera, and can change itself. Tumors aren't homogeneous, although many uh, oncologists pretend they are. They're really colonies of many different types of cancer cells, although typically, you know, 98% or 99% be one, and they try and kill that. That leaves that one or 2% to come back later. It later, this terrible disease, later transforms itself and spreads from one organ throughout uh, other organs. It's called metastasizing. Uh, we know these pathways that I just mentioned are associated with the growth of cancer and uh, you know, how the cancer survives, so you try and attack those pathways. And what has happened over the history of cancer is what we've done is the taxonomy of cancer is where it appears in your body. A more logical thing would be to base on the, the genetic, the DNA. We should have a taxonomy built on the DNA, and surprisingly, we don't have that information together yet to be able to do that, but surely that will happen. Surely there's some liver disease type of cancer that's related to breast cancer, and the therapies would work for one, would work for the other, but we haven't collected the information together to find out if that's true. But there's probably, you think of 20 
cancers that you know about, but there's probably thousands of subtypes. We don't quite know how many there are. And there's 1.6 million new cases just in the United States every year of people getting cancer. So the way these sequencing machines work is they take the biological information, break up these base pairs, uh, the chemical process of the base pairs in these little tiny 100 base pair sequences, and then we've created a reference genome. So you can think of it as a jigsaw puzzle. There's a box of a thousand, thousands of pieces of the jigsaw puzzle, and we got the cover of the box, which is the reference, and we're trying to assemble this jigsaw to match the box. And the things that don't fit, because it's actually all of us are a little bit different, less than 1% difference, but there's going to be some differences between the box and ourselves, so we have to identify these so-called variants. So we actually, to get our confidence up, we don't just read, get one copy of the DNA. We have 30 or 50 or 100 copies of it, and then we try and vote with these pieces line up. So these red things are supposed to show the differences from the reference genome. We try and figure out where they are, and then we vote and decide, oops, you vote and decide that's a so-called a variant, it's a difference from the reference. And then what we're done, all we have to show, since we know what the reference is, is whether the variance of, of that, and then that tells us what's different about you or your cancer from the standard reference. Typically what the process is at this bottom level, this is called alignment, the jigsaw puzzle matching. The SNP is like bit errors, it's single nucleotide polymorphism, but it's one of those ACCGs, is what letter should that, uh, that bit be? So calling out the individual bits, and then the really hard thing that's kind of a wide open problem, it's, given its biology, it's not just one bit errors, there's insertions and deletions and reversals and joining, separating where things shouldn't be, and this is for healthy normal ones, the cancer is even wilder than that, but the goal was to get this reconstructed genome. Uh, the software that gets created largely by scientists is pretty hard to use. This is a presentation that was given at a meeting I was at showing the, the, the sequencing that this person at Washington University had to go through. Uh, and it's uh, 119 steps from when he starts and it's over I think more than a week till he gets the, the, his, uh, the reference genome sequenced. Uh, so I was kind of struck at this meeting. They said that we have a data processing problem, and as I heard how they develop software, I thought, man, maybe you have a software engineering problem. So when I said that, uh, there was, I found this paper that appeared in Nature, one of the leading scientific publications, of a survey of scientists five years ago. Most of them are self-taught in programming, not too surprising. Only a third of them think formal training in software engineering is worthwhile. Uh, uh, sadly, that's not too surprising either, but as a result, only less than half of them have a good idea understanding of what testing is and why it's important. Uh, so to, what does this mean? Well, they must be having bugs in their papers. So here's an example uh, of a person, a colleague of ours at UC San Diego. He had to withdraw five papers because he used software from another research lab developed by scientists that had a bug in it. So this includes science. This is a magazine that rejects 97% of all the papers. So he had to go to science, say, take my paper back. There was a bug in the software I used. I, what I thought were results were bugs in the paper, sorry. And he had to do that for five papers, five papers. So I have never in my life had to withdraw papers. I, I don't want that ever, I never have, to, I don't want to be the person who's responsible to tell the scientists that they have to withdraw their papers because there was a bug in the software I was using. So this is a, you know, this is a real place for us to help since uh, we're supposed to know how to build software. So let's build these pipelines that are faster because we're going to get the tsunami of data more scalable and, you know, work. <laughs> uh, and that we, our, our goal is that they can use both for medical research and for clinical applications. We're going to focus on cancer because it's this very important genetic-based disease. And we've actually got an industry team uh, that's from Berkeley and Intel and Microsoft Research. Uh, we've got, you know, uh, the, the people doing the work, uh, that is the postdocs and graduate students and the external people there. The color coding system is supposed to be kind of orangish for systems, green for machine learning and computational biology and medicine, so lots of campuses and lots of areas and the faculty involved are over there on, the, uh, on the, my left. So our first result I talked about, we call it SNAP for Scalable Nucleotide Alignment Program. It's basically a big hash table. What we've done is, first of all, use longer seeds because what happens is these machines are getting more base pairs, so we used a much bigger seed than other attempts have been done. 
Uh, rather than uh, to save memory space, people would typically make each seed be distinct, so back to back. We did an overlapping kind of a sliding window of ones that uses up uh, a bigger hash table, but you know, machines are getting bigger and that can make it a lot faster. And we also use a clever uh, string comparison thing, which is naturally n squared. Instead, it's n times the difference because things are pretty close but not the same. So we get the speed up there. And we put those three things together and we use good software engineering techniques. We can get really good accuracy and good speed up. So this chart, it's a, it's a, a rock curve. It's a little complicated. The axis on, the, uh, on your left, the vertical axis, is the percent that we've covered that goes from 80% at the bottom to 100%. Uh, SNAP is ours in green, and then BWA is the one that most people use today, and Bowtie is a competitor to BWA. Uh, BWA stands for uh, Burroughs Wheeler algorithm, so not a hash table approach. But, um, you know, we're both more accurate, and then the error rate uh, is a very high error rate uh, on the left, going getting lower error rates on the right. And so over this whole distance, we're more accurate. Speed, we're, we're fast. <laughs> we're, uh, you know, a lot faster. Uh, and uh, interesting in dealing with the community, most of the people today, we're used to anticipating the future, that we can see the gene sequence is coming, this tsunami of data is going to come after us. So we thought speed was the most important thing to work on, but most scientists today, that hasn't happened to them, so they care more about accuracy. So we've got to be more accurate and a lot faster, and that's what we've done. Uh, the pipeline itself is written in C++. These are some of the steps that we talked about um, uh, there, and it's in C++ uh, to do, uh, it had, that we share across these different steps, algorithms, and our idea is to keep everything in memory so it's fast. A lot of other pipelines write to disk between each phases. Uh, we can get very fast I.O. and take advantage of multi-core by writing it in C++ um, and very efficient memory usage. Uh, our idea is to use modern computer systems. Modern computer systems have 16 cores and at least 128 gigabytes, so we can have big hash tables, keep everything in memory. And that's going to be our foundation. We provide an API to Scala and probably to, uh, and to probably Python, and then we can do the cluster approach in Spark. So we'd have the C++ core spread this over thousands of nodes and use Spark to write higher level algorithms and to make them work together. We, uh, so that's the first part, the faster pipelines. The second part is the, hopefully creating this gold mine of information. I was strongly influenced by uh, this book when I got ready for that talk, uh, Empire of All Maladies. Sudhakarthe Mukherjee is a medical doctor and a researcher and just an amazing writer. And he wrote this book that won the, the Pulitzer Prize for nonfiction about the history of cancer. Uh, what he says in this book, uh, he tells the terrible history of what's happened in the past that seems to be fads and poisoning people and butchering people is the way cancer has been fought. So he talks about this rosy future, which made me feel good towards the end of the book. So he talks about breast cancer. So a woman arrives at her oncologist. She's got, on some device, her entire genomes, uh, cancer genome sequence to to give to the oncologist. The oncologist uh, runs software that identifies these pathways that are causing the cancer. Uh, the, the oncologist gets these, uh, looks at the pathways, figures out the, the drugs that are supposed to uh, tackle it. It's going to be a cocktail because it's really these it, colony. It's not a single thing. But as the cancer in its nature transforms itself, we just keep sequencing and the cocktail changes. Either she'll be cured or she'll just have to take, like AIDS patients, some cocktail over life that transforms it. So that was great. That, I, when I got to that point in the book, this was exciting. <laughs> there's, a, there's hope, right? I really believe what he said about how pervasive it is. The problem was he said this is, is in 2050. So 2050 is a little late for me. <laughs> uh, so uh, and when you think about the numbers, it's astounding. I thought he was going to say 2020. The difference between 2020 and 2050 is 30 years, right? 30 years is like 50 more, 50 million people just in the United States getting cancer, or 20 million people dying of cancer. So I, my reaction to all this, because believe what he says, is I feel like I'm this character in the sci-fi movie. 
uh, one of these time travel things. So the closest thing I can come to is Terminator 2, right? So if you remember Terminator 2, not Terminator 1, but Terminator 2, Sarah Connors knows that Skynet is coming. And so her job is to beef herself up to ready to stop Skynet from happening, and this is what she looks like, right? So Sarah Connors is kind of the Terminator in Terminator 2. It's not the, Arnold Schwarzenegger is not the Terminator, it's Sarah Connors, because she knows this is happening, she's got to stop it because billions of people are going to die. So I feel like Sarah Connors, I've seen, but reversed, right? I've seen this future where cancer can be coped with, and it's just way out there, and I'm trying to bring it in. We are, our Skynet's already here, people are, you know, getting this terrible disease all the time, and let's hurry up. So when I go to these meetings, I've got this sense of urgency that people have been doing it for a while, uh, don't seem to share, but I, we can't wait. Uh, so what we did is, in cooperation with David Hausler and some of his people at UC Santa Cruz, who's a leader in genomics, we wrote this white paper uh, a couple of months ago about how, what would it take to have a million genome warehouse. Why do we want a million? To, because of all these subtypes, we need to get at least a million to get statistically significant results to believe about these therapies. Uh, he, David Hausler is running this institute right now, which has, it's at 10,000 rather than a million. Uh, he's got all, people from all over working on it. Uh, he's got a house at UC San Diego. So he has some experience of that that informed this paper. So what would it cost? You know, you want to have it in the cloud with all the computation near the storage because it's a lot more expensive to go to the network. And the cloud companies have showed these great economies of scale to bring the prices down. We estimated it'd be $25 a year per genome if we kept everything. So we, the main purpose of making that argument is don't throw stuff away, keep it all because it doesn't cost that much. Uh, because, at, you know, we haven't even got to $1,000 wet lab cost, so 25 isn't that much. So what prevents this from happening? A lot of the issues are non-technical. There's people called biomedical ethicists who are there to protect the rights of the patients. You know, uh, when we talk to disease advocates, Virtually, you know, more than 90% of the people are desperate to get their information out so we can make progress on these diseases, but there's this conflict between these two groups. Uh, right now, each study will typically have maybe 1,000 patients, so they'll get to a million, there'll be 1,000 studies, and to be a researcher, you'd have to get permission from 1,000 organizations, so we need a universal portable consent. Um, Scientists want to publish, and so if they've collected the data, it's theirs. They, they think of it as theirs. So the CG Hub says you get 18 months to publish before it becomes uh, public. As soon as you publish, then everybody can, can do research on it. You know, IP rights based on the data would cause problems, uh, and so CG Hub prevents that. We should let everybody in the world use it, not just those who have funding from one organization. And who's going to build it, right? That's a, a, you know, is it the government? Slow-moving thing. Private businesses, will they be exclusive opening, or can we create a nonprofit that hopefully could do uh, many of these things? So my last, well, one, second to last slide now is just reviewing this. So this is happening, the, the $1,000 genome, maybe by the end of this year, which is seen to be a tipping point. Uh, cancer is this terrible disease that kills just the United States, 600,000 uh, people a year. And there's this chance for people like us to really help, to build these pipelines that are fast and accurate and cr help create the storage that will be dependable, privacy protecting, uh, and associate patient outcomes. And like I said, like Sarah Connors, I, I want this future and time to help me and my family, not something that will happen long after I'm gone. So my final slide, and this is what happened after I gave that talk in San Diego. I told the people in the ampli, hey, the talk went well, but I've got this problem. <laughs> I woke up, I believe what I said. <laughs> so if there's this chance that computer scientists could help millions of people with this terrible disease live longer and better lives, as moral people, aren't we obligated to try? All right, I'm ready for questions. Okay. Yes. Uh, why not pretty elements? Yeah, yeah, that's funny. <laughs> uh, people will say that. Well, why don't you go higher up? It, I think uh, I have a very limited background. I, I, I believe proteomics will also be important. Genetics is the, is the next straightforward, obvious step to do. We may be able to make a lot of progress just with, uh, with genetics, and we'll see. Uh, but proteomics would be another thing we could do that beyond that. Yes? There's, uh, uh, Bill. Well, the, the bone marrow uh, registry that Congress created about 20 years ago was to match up, you know, kind of genetically uh, bone marrow, like about 10 million uh, people who volunteered to donate with about 10,000 uh, 10, of feet each year. But a, a byproduct that the Congress was very smart of causing a data. 
Right. He's talking about a bone marrow database that was created a while. Yeah, that would be an interesting, because they had to uh, cover that same patient consent and privacy issues. It'd be interesting to see how that was, that was done. I've been to a bunch of these meetings. Nobody's brought that one up, so I'll, I'll ask about it. Back there. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's a vision that you and I would call personalized medicine, but there's actually been a National Academy's report called precision medicine. And what happens today, the medical cancer treatment that you, you would get if you, you unfortunately got it today is you'd get average case analysis. This is, for this type of disease, this is what we, be, we believe this is the best way to treat it, and you get treated like everybody else in your situation. The vision of what's precision medicine or personalized medicine, let's look at your uh, your healthy cells, your DNA, your tumor cells, your DNA. Let's look it up in this repository. What's happened with different treatments for other people and to see what we should be with you. There's many cases of therapies that have been created that don't work in the average case, but do work for some people. There's, there's examples of that. So the average case might uh, not work for you uh, or they would think a drug failed, but actually could help you. So that's that vision, is this personalized medicine based on your DNA material. Yes? Last question. Right. Uh, yeah. So the 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 you know kind of the, the the biomedical community always puts up that slide with the dropping cost of genetic. It's faster than Moore's law. There's it's a, vi a vibrant c competitive marketplace right now. There's an Intel for the sequencing equipment. Illumina dominates that. Um, the, there's a limited accuracy of that piece of equipment. Uh, I think it kind of, we're relying on capitalism to, uh, to innovate in proving the accuracy that's going on. I think part of what the AMP Lab talks about is having uh, air bars on everything. And I think uh, that idea we want to bring into our pipeline is what's the confidence level that we have on the data we have. Don't throw that information away, which typically happens with the tools today. They write to files, throw everything away, and you load it up again. We want to keep everything in memory. Uh, don't throw anything away. Keep track of the air bars to improve the accuracy as we go along. Uh, but yeah, that, I think, you know, that's not my area, but it seems to be a lot of companies trying to innovate, so I'm hoping uh, that the accuracy will improve over this as well. Great. I think with that, I'd like to thank Dave. <laughs>